Okay, so remember uh, that the paper two has three sections to it. Okay, there's section A, and then there's section B, and then there's section C. La. Okay, and uh, section A is a section with eight questions. Okay, section B is uh, two questions, choose one. And that is the one with the choosing questions. Uh, you're given a table, and you choose, 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 then you make the best choice. And then section C is a compulsory one question, which is... Um, uh, which is the one that you have to modify and you have to change this and change that. Lah. Okay, so uh, again, the purpose of this module lah, is for revision. That's why uh, the number of questions you see here, it is not a trial paper. Okay, the, I know that you guys are doing trial papers with the, the, the other subjects, but I only want to cover the trial papers after we come back. Uh, to school uh, but I still want you to answer a couple of questions just to keep that momentum of revision going now. okay so I hope that by these holidays we can finish this entire module uh, yeah as quick as we can okay let's look at the first question now. so diagram one shows a velocity against time graph of a toy car Okay, uh, so the first question is obviously what is meant uh, by velocity velocity is the uh, even if I annotate it won't work. Sorry, <laughs> our velocity is the rate. Okay, so the key word now for velocity, okay, would be the rate. Saya mau juga kan kasih masuk jawapan rate of change of displacement. Okay, and I want to highlight this perkataan rate of change uh, because the words uh, rate of change uh, is always used a lot uh, whenever we're talking about acceleration, whenever we're talking about velocity. Okay, so you want to remember these very important words. Okay, rate of change of. Lah. Okay, so for example, uh, acceleration is the rate of change of, the, uh, of velocity. Okay, so that will be what velocity. Ah, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, that's acceleration. But the words rate of change of lah. Okay. Uh, we very rarely use uh formula. Okay. Uh, I know that formulas are sometimes given, uh, but we very rarely use formula for, uh, for this one lah. Okay, for definition. So it's good to remember the definitions. Okay, based on graph in diagram one, state the type of motion of the toy car. Okay, uh, and during t equals to two seconds. So at this at this particular point in time, we can talk about the type of motion. So when we talk about type of motion, okay, uh, we have to talk about whether it is uh, the few answers that are very normal. Okay, the few answers that are very normal could be uh, increasing, okay, increasing velocity, alias uh, uniform or constant acceleration. These two usually come together. Okay, dan dia punya terbalik pun. It's not the answer for this, but I'm just telling you that, oh, sorry, it, this is the answer lah. <laughs> okay, because how do you know? Uh, because the velocity is increasing in a straight line. Okay, the velocity is increasing in a straight line for a V against T graph. We're talking about increasing velocity slash uniform acceleration. Okay. And the best part about this uh, is that if you have a straight line like this, okay, which is a flat line, uh, okay, any straight flat line, okay, is always a constant something, uh, okay. And since this is a velocity graph, this will be constant velocity. So that will be the answer for after three, after after the three seconds, uh, okay, which is constant velocity. Gosh. It's terrible. I need to figure out <coughs> how to get my internet connection to be better. Okay. Um, so this is a very important thing to remember. Huh? Okay, that if the whatever graph you have, there are two types of graph. One is a velocity time graph, the other one is a displacement time graph. Displacement time graph, if it is a flat line like this, okay, then it will be constant. Uh, sorry, it will be uh, zero velocity or it will be at a constant position. Lah. Okay, but we usually don't say constant position because the question asks for type of motion. So you want to talk about velocity or you want to talk about acceleration. Okay, uh, very rarely uh, we ask about the position. Lah. 
Okay, so have these answers in mind nah, when you're talking about type of motion. Okay, jenis gerakan. Nah, adakah dia sedang berlaju, dia sedang perlahan? Okay, dan kalau dia semakin laju, ah, if it is getting faster, you need to talk about how it is getting faster. Okay, it is, is it an is it an increasing velocity with a uniform acceleration or is it an increasing velocity with an increasing acceleration? If it is an increasing acceleration, okay, this will be how it will look like. Lah. Okay, this is a graph. Okay, sorry, a graph like this, lah, yang ada, you know, that is a lengkong macam ni. Okay, so this is an increasing acceleration and increasing velocity. Okay, if it is a straight line like that, it's increasing velocity and uniform uh, acceleration. So the shape of the graph, I uh, will tell you how it will look like. Lah. Okay, all right, next. Um, how the displacement of the toy car in four seconds is determined. Okay, so how do you determine the displacement? For velocity time graph, you determine the displacement by finding the area under the graph. Okay, so... Too long area under the graph. Okay, or calculate lah. Okay, calculate the area under the graph. Okay, that would be how you determine the displacement of the toy car because toy car because this is a velocity time graph. Okay, so again uh, just to recap. Okay, velocity time or actually anything to do with these motion graphs, uh, there are only two things that you have to think about. Either the acceleration, sorry, either the gradient or the acceleration. Okay, in a velocity time graph, the gradient represents, okay, the gradient represents the acceleration. Okay, manakala the area under the graph represents the displacement or distance. Lah. Actually, mostly distance. Lah. I would say distance is a better answer. Okay, for a velocity time graph, which is the most common graph uh, that is always asked in usually uh, paper one and paper two questions, especially paper one. Okay, so you need to have this in mind. It's not uh, okay from here, uh, then you just calculate, calculate. No, uh, you have to know uh, what you're talking about. The gradient represents the acceleration, the area represents the distance for a velocity time graph. Okay, so you need to know how to determine the displacement from uh, the distance, from this graph okay either the gradient or the area only these two things all right question two so diagram two shows a water rocket bottle that is launched uh, okay uh, using the bicycle pump at the open field okay the bottle was ejected at high speed and the rocket bottle is launched okay wow okay now, the physics principle that is involved in this, usually for rocket, okay, we're talking about the principle of conservation of momentum. Okay, conservation of momentum. Most of the time, rocket is this. Lah. Okay, rocket, jet engine. Uh, yeah, jet engine is this way. Rocket is this way. Lah. Okay, so we always talk about principle of conservation of momentum. And this principle needs to be written in full. Lah. You cannot write principle mm. of momentum. Okay, or just momentum alone. Momentum is a concept. Okay, the question very clearly states the physics principle. Okay, and physics principles don't change like they don't like you no know, tiba tiba principle of momentum apply to together. Now, what is the total momentum of the rocket before launching? Okay, let's recap a little bit. Huh? momentum is defined as okay, momentum is mass times velocity. <laughs> Some calories, sorry. Okay, so momentum is mass times velocity. The big something that has mass and is moving uh, has momentum. Okay, according to physics. Let me repeat uh, something that has mass and is moving, okay, has momentum. Okay, throw away the quantum physics for a while. Uh. I know that quantum physics is different a bit because there's no mass, photons have no mass, but well, we're talking about classical physics now. Okay, something that has mass and velocity will have momentum. Now, before the rocket is launching, does it have mass? Okay, it has. Does it have velocity? No, because it's not moving. So, the total momentum will actually be zero. Okay, because it is not moving. Okay, number one, or, you know, number one, 
the number one clue uh, that should tell you that this is not a calculation question is that they give you these lines over here. Okay, most of the time lines are, it's like, okay, one-liners only. Lah. Okay, there is no answer that you know that you need to write la or what, what, what. Lah. Okay, so be aware of this. Okay, next one. Now, if the math... <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem now. You know why? Because I have to type out all these answers and I don't have my pen with me. No, my tab is entahlah kenapa ni saya punya, you know, saya punya internet connection. I think during the break, I will try to fix the internet connection. But let me, let me see what happens. Okay, the mass of the rocket is 0 0.2 kg and the velocity of the water ejected is 2 meters per second. Okay, now if the mass of the water is 0 0.2 kg, calculate the velocity of the rocket launch. Oh, sorry. The mass of the rocket is 0 0.2 kg and the water ejected is 2 meters per second. Okay, so again, this will be the principle of conservation of momentum where uh, the total momentum before equals to the total momentum after. Okay, so let me do this first. Total momentum before equals to total momentum after. Now we have already established that the total momentum before is zero. Okay, so sorry. Okay, zero equals two. Okay, then the total momentum is the momentum of the rocket plus the momentum of the water. And since we have the velocity of the water and the mass of the water, so I can immediately put 0 0.2 times 2 because the mass of the water is 0 0.2 times the mass of the, velo the velocity of the water is 2. So 0 0.2 times 2 plus, okay, the mass of the uh, rocket is 0 0.2. But what about the velocity of the rocket? Okay, it's a different one. Lah. Now, take into consideration uh, that the water is going towards the left and the rocket is going towards the right. So by right, uh, this velocity over here should be negative 2, okay, in order for this calculation to work. Okay, so please put a star somewhere in this question, uh, okay, that the direction of the velocity is very important. Okay, direction of velocity, sangat penting. Okay, don't just simply put the 2 over there and then, oh, okay, pandai sudah saya menghira. Okay, no, uh, please, uh, okay, velocity is very important. So when you calculate, calculate this, <laughs> okay, when you calculate, calculate this, you will get V equals to 2 as well. Uh, 2 and then of course, don't forget the unit, 2 meters per second. Very frustrating because I cannot use my tab. So it's like a waste of time. Sorry, no, not a waste of time. Uh. We make the best of the situation. Okay. All right. Next question. What will happen to the speed of the rocket after a few while? <laughs> Sorry. After a few moments. Okay. Tak kita maafkan lah kalau bahasa Inggris tidak menunjukkan. Okay. Standard answers uh, for what will happen. I want to remind you again uh, of the words what will happen. Okay. What will happen? There are only three standard answers. Either it increases, okay, or decrease, and the third one will be it remains unchanged. Okay. Now, if you think about this situation, okay, first the water bottle rocket is launched at two meters per second. Okay. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, should be correct, but you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, you know, it is uh, launched at 2 meters per second and after a while, what do you think will happen to the speed of the rocket? Obviously, it will decrease. Lah. Why would it decrease? Because of, uh, because of air resistance. Okay. So, uh, again, just to remind us that if you don't know how to answer this question, what will happen? Okay, if you don't know how to answer what will happen question, just remember that it is only one of these three answers. Either it will increase, decrease, or unchange. There are some questions, of course. There are some questions which is a little bit different. Lah. Okay, like the answer will be a little bit different. Uh, but we will look at it as we can. But as a general rule, soalan-soalan yang melibatkan what will happen usually is increase, decrease, or remain unchanged. Okay, so one of these three questions, uh, one of these three answers in mind uh, will help you. Lah. Okay, number three. 
diagram 3.1, sorry, 3.1 and 3.2 show two identical containers uh, filled with two types of liquids, okay, of different specific heat capacities. Okay, but of the same mass heated with identical immersion heaters, one kilowatt for 10 minutes. Okay, so the number one thing that I want to remind you is what is an immersion heater? Because always people uh, don't know what is immersion heater. Immersion heater is pemanas rendam. And sometimes dalam bahasa Melayu pun orang tidak tahu apa itu pemanas rendam. Okay, immersion heater is just a, it's just a metal that you put inside water to heat up the water. Okay, we don't really think about immersion heater because how do we boil the water using electric kettle? We just turn on the kettle, right? But actually inside there, yang, you know, the logam, logam inside there, the metal that is inside that one is called an immersion heater. Okay, it can only heat when it is immersed in the water. Bila logam itu direndamkan di dalam air, then dia boleh jadi panas lah kan? Okay, so that's why it's called an immersion heater. Okay, immersion heater is something that you use well, those of you who use electric kettle, you use it almost every day. Okay, so now it's a good time to know what it is. Now, let's talk about specific heat capacity. Yeah? Okay, specific heat capacity. And since this is a revision, okay, so we want to talk about the important things about specific heat capacity. Okay, specific heat capacity. If there's a small specific heat capacity, it means that it is easy to heat up. Okay, if the specific heat capacity is big, okay, it is difficult to heat up. Heat up means uh, okay, increase in temperature. Okay, doesn't mean that it won't increase in temperature. I'm just saying that it is difficult to increase the temperature. You need a longer time to increase the temperature. Okay, so easy to heat up. Uh, if the specific capacity is small, it is easy to heat up. If it is big, it is difficult to heat up. So examples of small specific capacity, okay, will be uh, metals. Okay, metals uh, usually have small specific capacity because you panaskan sekejap kan, terus jadi panas sudah. Okay, manakala big specific capacity will be things like plastic, okay, wood, uh, water. All these have very, very big specific capacities. Okay, it takes a while for it to heat up. We don't think about this uh, because for us, uh, again, uh, I always say this, uh, we don't think about this because for us, is kita pasang saja air kan, kita pasang saja Swiss kan, terus air menjadi panas. Okay, but what we fail to recognize uh, is the amount of heat, uh, okay, is the amount of heat that you need uh, to heat up that water. Okay, so we always think that water is very easy to heat up, right? Actually, it's not. Okay, it's very difficult to heat up water. Okay, it's just that we are so used to fire kan, we just, you know, kita pandang rendah lah sama air. But actually, that's not the case lah. Okay, so have this in mind uh, when we're talking about this. Now, what is the meaning of specific heat capacity? One of the most difficult, uh, one of the most difficult uh, definitions to remember is the specific heat capacity uh, definition. Okay, but if it helps, it is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kg of substance by one degree Celsius. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't have the this one. Okay. Celsius. Okay. Amount of heat energy. Okay. Required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of substance by one degree Celsius. The most important word. Okay, in this is the one kilogram. Selalu orang lupa ini one kilogram ini. Okay, uh, of course by one degree Celsius. It is the specific capacity uh, involves uh, the raising in temperature. The opposite of specific capacity. Okay, I'm going to talk about the opposite a little while. Uh, let me change the color for this. Lah. Okay, the opposite of specific capacity is specific latent heat. Okay, specific latent heat is the amount of heat energy okay, required to change the state. Okay, change the state or change the condition of matter okay, uh, of 1 kg of substance. Okay, so specific latent heat is the amount of heat you need to change the state of 1 kg of substance. When we talk about the states of matter, okay, state. There are only three states of matter in classical physics, okay, which is either physic, uh, sorry, physical block. Apa itu solid, okay, to liquid, 
to gas or vapor. Fine, gas lah. Okay, the three states of matter, solid to liquid, liquid to gas. Okay, and uh, I will not go into too much detail about the different different types of specific latent heat. Like there's vaporization, there's fusion. Uh, but just remember that the definitions are very slightly different. Okay, specific latent heat is to change state. Specific heat capacity is to change the temperature. Okay, is to change the temperature. So be aware of these differences. Okay, it is not the same thing. Now, based on diagram 3.1 and 3.2, give a reason why the reading on the thermometer is different for 10 minutes. Why? Why is the reading different for 10 minutes? Hold on. Uh. Okay, the reading is different. After 10 minutes, okay, initial temperature is 25, but after 10 minutes, P liquid is 60, Q liquid is 70. Okay, so the reason why the reading on the thermometer are uh, Sorry, the reason why the reading on the thermometer reading, the reading on the thermometer is different after 10 minutes. Hold on. Uh. Let me see what the answer is. Oh, okay. So the reading will be different because, okay, notice that Q has a smaller, uh, Q has a smaller specific heat capacity. Okay, so Q has a smaller specific heat capacity. So remember I said just now, smaller heat capacity means faster get hotter, faster raise temperature. Okay, I say not faster get hotter, like faster increase in temperature. Okay, so that would be the answer for this. Like. <clears throat> so you can either say that Q has a smaller specific heat capacity than P or P has a bigger specific capacity than Q. I don't want to base answers will do. Okay, of course, SHC has to be written in full. Uh, okay, I'm just writing it in short form uh, just to remind you. So you talk about the difference in the specific capacity because you know that Q is a smaller specific capacity. Smaller specific capacity means it is easy to increase temperature. Okay, that's why even after how many? Uh, after 10 minutes, uh, you give the same amount of heat, one kilowatt, okay, the same amount of time, which is 10 minutes, okay, but you get different reading temperature, different temperature reading because the specific heat capacity is different. Okay, so, so Q has a smaller specific capacity, so it will increase much higher. Okay, so calculate the heat energy supplied by the immersion heater. Okay, whenever we talk about immersion heater, okay, the formula that is involved, huh, okay, is usually we write this, right? PT equals to MC, ugh, sorry, I don't know why it's theta. I'm going to write this as theta. Lah, huh? Okay, fine. PT equals to MC theta. Okay, but we also need to remember that both of these, huh, sebelah kiri and sebelah kanan, both of it is actually Q. Both of it is actually heat energy. So we can say that Q, which is heat energy, equals to PT or Q equals to MC delta theta. <coughs> Sorry, my horrendous this one, but fine. Okay, let's just use it as it is. Huh? Okay, so what you do is Question is asking for what? Question is asking for the heat energy supplied by the immersion heater. The immersion heater is P times T. Okay, so we use the formula of Q equals to P times T. Okay, and then uh, the P is given, uh, what is the power? One kilowatt. So change it to watts. Okay, 1000 watts. Okay, and then the time is 10 minutes. And we know that in T, for heat, lah, okay, it's always changed to seconds. So it'd be 10 times 60 times 60. You need to change the 10 minutes to uh, seconds in order for you to get uh, this answer. Oh, yeah, lah, sorry. Times 60 once only. Thank you, thank you, Karima. Oh, yeah, because this minute changed to this one. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, 600,000, is that correct? 600,000 joules. Okay, 600,000 joules. Huh? So let's go ahead. Now, we know that in this case, huh, okay, the heat energy from the immersion heater okay, is supplied to this 
you know, it's supplied to both. Lah. We're supplying 6, 600,000 joules of heat energy into the water, into the liquids. Okay. Of course, in this case, it's counting the mass of the liquid Q. So we use this 600,000 and kita kasih sama dengan MC theta, okay, which is over here. So we will have 600,000 okay, equals to the mass is 1 kilogram. Is it 1 kilogram? Uh, oh, the mass is what we want to count. Sorry, 3268 is the C. So uh, 3268M, the C is 3268, and then the delta theta is 70 minus 25 because the original temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. After 10 minutes, okay, it has been uh, changed to 70 degrees Celsius. So that is the change in temperature that is involved. Okay. And so you will get the answer m equals to sorry 70 minus 25 divided by 3268 4.07 okay 4.08 lah okay kilograms okay correct me if I'm wrong lah uh, for this <coughs> okay. And actually, by that definition also, we can also calculate the this one of p lah. But since they have the same, this since they have the same uh, mass, it should be the same lah. Okay, about four point zero eight kg. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong lah. If uh, there's nothing else, then I will continue to question number four. Okay. All right. Hold on ah. Oh, okay. Right, question number four is a radioactivity question. Okay, the diagram four shows decay series of bismuth 214. Okay, in the nucleon and a proton number graph, okay, this is a very important thing to remember. Lah. Usually, yeah, uh, this graph shows us the kind of decay that happens. Okay, uh, and we have learned that in radioactive decay, there are three types of decay, which is the alpha decay, the beta decay, and the gamma decay. Okay, the alpha decay is uh, what after the decay, uh, the neutrons uh, will be less for, sorry, for two, right? Sorry, nucleon number. Nucleon, okay, will be less for proton, okay, less two. Okay, if for the beta decay, okay, nucleon, no change, okay, proton will be plus one. Okay, gamma is totally no change altogether. Okay, there is no change in all of this. Okay, so when we look at this graph, uh, it's important for us to note that the one that slants down like this uh, usually is a representation, one arrow like this, uh, is a representation of an alpha decay. Okay, how do I know? Because it goes from 214 to 210. So the nucleon is less 4 already. And at the same time, the protons from 83 go to 81. So it's proton less 2. So one arrow like this is representing uh, an alpha decay. Okay. Manakala, uh, an arrow that goes this way, okay, to the right, without changing the nucleon number, the proton number increase, increase, increase. So this is a beta decay and since there are three arrows of increasing proton numbers this will be three beta decays okay so even without looking at the question now uh, one glance you know that this entire process from bismuth 214 to plumbum 206 uh, involves two alpha and three beta decays Okay, how do I know that? Because there's two senget punya arrow and three straight arrows. Okay, to the right. Two senget to the left, three to the right. That is a representation of two alpha and three beta. Okay, decays. What is meant by the nuclear number? Nuclear number, this one is from chemistry and is also asked in physics. Okay, nuclear number is the sum of proton and neutrons. Okay, in an atom. 
double check. Uh, yeah, okay. In the nucleus of an atom, uh, fine. In the nucleus of an atom. Okay, that is the nuclear number. Hasil jumlah proton dan neutron di dalam satu nucleus atom. Okay, right. <laughs> Oh no, this is hard. I'm not going to be able to write this using my this one. Write an equation to show the decay of bismuth 214 to Ti to 210. Okay. Oh no. Uh, okay, so the Ti 210 is just this. Lah. Okay. When you write this one, hmm, okay, hold on. let me share the other one with you. Lah. Okay. Yeah. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Okay, Astaga. Can you see this? This is the answer. Okay, this is how you write this. Lah. Remember uh, to always write on the other side because we always want the thunder plus. Okay, so 214, Bismuth 21483. We get this number from the graph. Okay, it will decay to Ti210 to 80, uh, 81 plus uh, helium 42 which is the alpha particle, okay, which is the alpha particle. All right, sorry, uh, let me share this one. Okay, so why does the decay of bismuth 214 happen? Okay, why does any decay happen? Okay, so all the decays happen is uh, because the unstable nucleus, lah. okay, unstable nucleus. The nucleus is unstable and it wants to become stable. Okay, so that's why it changes into you no know, unstable nucleus becomes more stable. Okay, every decay, decay, radioactive decay is a process of changing the unstable nucleus to become a more stable nucleus. Okay, and that's why it occurs. Keep the answer short and simple. Don't overwrite because it's only one mark. Lah. Okay, and you want to avoid a situation where you overwrite now and then suddenly you know you write so much, so much, so much, then suddenly your answer becomes wrong because you know you overwrote it. Okay, keep it short and sweet whenever you can. Okay, the decay of polonium 210 can be represented by below. Okay, of course, this is very easily determined. Okay, x will be uh you know all you need to do is just sum lah, sabakiri 84. If this is 2, obviously x will be 82. Lah. Okay, it's a very simple mathematics. 210, 206. So the remainder of this will be 4. Okay, and even if you don't know that it's 4, if you don't know how to count it, nah, you should know that helium, the alpha particle for helium, will be helium 42. Okay, I've said this again and again helium 42, helium 42, helium 42 is the alpha particle. Electron 0, negative 1. Okay, so these are things that you need to remember uh, when we talk about this. Okay, and every question, la, usually questions that ask this la, will always have this question. Determine the number of alpha particles and beta particles produced in the entire decay series, which is this one. Okay, then our awal sudah saya, saya tengok soalan, sorry, saya tengok keadaan, la, I look at the situation and Oh, okay. There is two alpha particles and three beta particles. Okay, so you can write uh, exactly this answer. Okay, two alpha and three beta. Okay. So, you know, right now we are all at this, you know, knowledge level questions that we haven't come to the more challenging ones yet. But again, everybody, just, just to remind you that this is a revision class. Okay, we have not actually gone into the, you know, like the trial papers, which I know some of you are doing. Okay, just take it slow and easy. Don't worry about it. Okay, the mass before decay for bismuth 214 is 200 grams. Okay, if the half-life is 19.7 minutes, calculate the mass after 98.5 minutes. Okay, so we want so this one we have to talk about half-life and we're talking about 19.7 to 98.5. So the first thing that we need to know is to determine how many half-lives there are. Okay, you can do this uh, manually. Lah. Okay, so we're going to start 
uh, 19.7, if it's 98.5, if you divide it, uh, 98.5 divided by 19.7, it's five half-lives. Okay, so there'll be uh, 98.7 divided by 9, sorry, 98.5 divided by 19.7, okay, equals to five half-lives. Okay, five half-lives, uh, which means that if our original starts with 200, okay, 200, <sighs> okay, so every arrow, uh, every arrow looking thing is one half-life, uh, okay, so 200 will become 100, okay, and that's one half-life. Second half-life will be 200 become 100, 100 become if you are sit, if you sit zero, uh, okay, then you know that you need to wake up. Okay, it's not zero because this is not an arithmetic progression. It is a geometric progression. It will never hit zero. Okay, so this is a very common mistake uh, that people make. No, dua ratus, ratus, logically is kosong lah kan? But no, it will always be divided by two. Remember this, 50. After 50 becomes... 25. How many half-lives do we have? 1, 2, 3. So far, 3. Okay, 4 half-life. 25 will become 12.5. And finally, after 5 half-lives, it will become 6.25 grams. Okay, so usually we will use this method to count. Lah. Okay, of course, there is another method uh, to calculate using the formula. Okay, and I'm going to show the, this one to you. So this is how it would look like. Okay, so this is the formula. Okay, the, the formula will be n equals to 1 over 2 to the power of small n, which is how many half-lives, times the initial mass. Okay, n is the final mass. Huh? You know what, let me write this here. Okay, so the big n, okay, is the final mass or the final activity. Lah. Okay, the small n, Okay, is the number of half lives. Okay, and the n zero, <laughs> okay, is the initial mass. Initial mass or initial activity lah. I'm using this very interchangeably. So I might to cut to Okay, so we will get six point two five grams. Okay, which is our answer for here. Okay. Let's carry on to the next question, uh, number five. <laughs> there are many questions, so I'm like rushing, rushing, rushing. Okay, diagram 5 point one shows an electric circuit. This is a very important thing. Okay, uh, a triangle with a straight line like this. This will obviously be a diode. Lah. Okay, the component X is a diode. Okay, so the question is, is this bulb going to be lighted up? Okay, obviously the answer will be yes. How do you know that it's going to be lighted up? Okay, what does what is the function of the diode? The function of the diode is okay, let's talk about the diode. Huh? Okay, function to allow current to pass through in one direction only. Okay, that's the function of the diode. To allow current to pass through in one direction only. And the good news is the direction of the triangle tells you which is the direction of the current that it will allow to flow. Okay, if the current, uh, I really hate that I don't have a pen. <laughs> if the current is flowing this way, it will not, the diode will stop. Okay, so it's not masuk. But if the current is flowing this way, following the direction of the triangle, okay, the current will be allowed to flow. That's how I know that this bulb is going to light up because the positive kaki is here and the negative terminal is here. So the current is going to flow from here, passing through the diode and passing through the light bulb because the diode is in the same direction as the current flow. Okay, so the reason, okay, the reason for this, huh? so how do you know that it's going to flow? Okay, and usually, the, sorry, usually the reasons uh, are for current flow, okay, when we talk about diode, okay, it is because it is uh, uh, the circuit, sorry, the diode, okay, is arranged, okay, forward biased. 
answer in the exam, we jawab diode can liao ka, or we need to jawab semiconductor diode. Semiconductor diode is fine, but diode is also fine. Why must be semiconductor? Also can lie if you want. Okay, the diode is arranged forward bias. Okay, now if you understand the working principle, or if you remember the working principle of a diode, okay, you will also know that when the diode is arranged forward bias, okay, I'm giving an alternative answer. You don't have to do this if you don't if you don't remember, but when the diode is arranged forward bias, okay, we find that the depletion region, uh, okay, becomes narrower. Narrower is that such a word as narrower? It becomes smaller. Fine. Okay, now if you don't know what the depletion region is, or if you have forgotten what the depletion region is, go and watch the video, previous, previous video when I was teaching diet. Okay, but if you, if you like, okay, I have too many things to remember. I don't remember this. You don't have to remember actually. Okay, the most important one is you need to know whether it's forward bias or reverse bias. How do you know that it's forward bias or reverse bias? Okay, so forward bias is the positive terminal of the battery is connected to the positive terminal of or the p-junction okay so in a diode uh, sorry in a diode the triangle uh, okay represents the p-junction okay the triangle part represents the p-junction and the bar over here this long bar here represents the n-junction okay so P junction and N junction. Manakala on a battery, and I hope that you know this already. Lah, okay, after going through one experiment, okay, and don't know how many times of this one, I hope you know that the long leg ah, is the positive terminal of the battery. Okay, it still amazes me how some people don't know this. And the short leg, ah, okay, the short leg is the negative terminal of the battery. Okay. So, how do you know that it's connected forward bias? The positive terminal of the battery is connected to the P-junction and the negative terminal of the battery is somehow connected to the N-junction. Then you know it is forward bias. Okay? If, let's say, I switch the diode around, okay, I switch the diode around or I switch the, the battery around, you will find that it will be reverse bias. And any connection of a diode in reverse bias will not allow the, uh, the current to flow through. Okay, so Zoom tells me that my internet connection is a little bit unstable. So if I'm breaking up, then please let me know. Lah. <clears throat> okay, diagram 5.2 shows the current against potential difference of the circuit in diagram 5.1. Okay, so this is the current against potential difference. Now notice uh, that this is current against potential difference, uh, I against V. Okay, notice that it is first curved and then it is a straight line. Okay, it is first curved and then it is a straight line. So again, what happens to the current when the potential difference increases? Again, we see the words, what happened? Okay, so obviously the answer will be increase. Lah. When the current increase, the potential difference, sorry, when the potential difference increase, the current also increase. Okay, so increases. Okay, calculate the gradient K at the range of 0 0.5 to 1M. So the straight line part over here. Okay, so when you calculate the gradient, calculating gradient, I think everybody should know how to do already. Y2 minus Y1, X2 minus X1. You will get the answer uh, 2.5. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, you will get the answer of 2.5. But the problem is always, okay, the problem as always, lah, okay, all physics teachers will tell you, what is the unit? Okay. So the unit is the y-axis punya unit divided by the x-axis punya unit. So it will be a v negative 1. Okay, sorry, uh, this negative 1 make it smaller. Lah, huh? Okay, a v negative 1. Okay, so when you calculate, you get 2.5 a v negative 1. Okay, and then the question is, based on the answer in 5b2, calculate the resistance R for component X. Okay, so 
what is the relationship uh, between this gradient and the resistance? Okay, so we have to come back to Ohm's law for this. So if <laughs> I don't have my pen with me. Okay, so in Ohm's law, okay, in Ohm's law, Ohm's law states that the resistance uh, is actually the voltage divided by the current. Okay. Resistance is the voltage divided by the current. But this one is current divided by the voltage. Because when you calculate the gradient, the y-axis is current. Divide by the voltage, which is the x-axis. So how do we get the resistance from this value of 2.5? We just simply flip it over. Okay, so based on that, we will get that R equals to 1 divided by 2.5. 1 over 2.5. Okay, because this is V per A. Oh, sorry, this is A per V. But resistance is V per A, or V per I. Okay, so 1 over 2.5. And this will give us the answer of 0 0.4. And what is the unit for resistance? Ohms. Okay, so again, I don't have the <laughs> symbol. Uh. Okay, the symbol for ohms is this, the omega thing. Uh. Okay, this one. Okay, look at my ugly, ugly annotation using mouse. <clears throat> okay. Wow, I hope tonight uh, my internet connection is severely better. Otherwise, I'm going to have a lot of problem with... <laughs> with uh, yeah, I'm going to have a lot of problem with doing the ad maths one. We'll see how it goes. Okay, maybe I'll change. Oh, maybe I will go to... Uh, maybe I should go to a coffee shop. We go to Starbucks. I don't know what class is in the room. I don't have a class. I want to go to Soho sometimes to do class. Okay, what will happen to the graph in diagram 5.2 if the component X is replaced uh, with a carbon resistor? Okay. Uh, so if I replace this one, component X, which is... What is this component X? Sorry, hold on. Oh, if I replace the diode, okay, if I replace the diode with a carbon resistor. Sorry, uh, who is Wu Chung Cheng? Uh? Is it Jacinta's parents? Uh? Yeah, I'm just going to admit uh, if there's a stranger come in and suddenly spam all of us. Uh, please let me know. Okay. Uh, if I replace <laughs> if I replace the diode, okay, with a current resistor with a resistor. 5SC. Uh. Wu Chung Cheng. Oh, it's not Jacinta's father. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. The only Wu I know is Jacinta Wu. So, yeah. And Wu is a very... Uh, apa? Jarang ba orang ada nama surname Wu kan? So, yeah. Anyway. Um, apa ni ikbal tiba-tiba pisang? Kalau kamu makan pisang, silakan makan pisang. Okay. What will happen now uh, is... If I replace this with a resistor, okay, if a normal resistor, like, I don't know why they have to say carbon resistor, but fine, okay, if carbon resistor. What will happen to the graph? Okay, so the graph will become directly proportional. Okay, so graph will become directly proportional. Okay, so the graph of uh, I against V. Lah. Okay, will become directly proportional or something similar to that effect. Lah. Okay. Why? Eh? Okay, why? Because right now we are putting a diode in. Okay, right now we're putting a diode in and when we do a diode, uh, we find that the graph first is a curve and then after it becomes a straight line. Okay, it doesn't follow Ohm's law at first and then it follows Ohm's law because it's a diode. Okay, and then we're talking about, you know, depletion region, blah, 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 all those things. Lah. Okay, well, all those things will affect the, there's Ashley also, uh, who is Ashley? Okay, so, you know, all those things will affect the, 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 the resistance. Lah. So, it will increase, it will increase non-linearly and then suddenly it will linearly increase. But when we put a normal resistor, okay, so then this is totally Ohm's law already. 
Okay, and we have actually done the Ohm's law, you know, experiment like entah lah, some few months ago, lah, I don't know when we did the Ohm's law, where the graph is actually a straight line. Okay, and uh, I think this would be a good opportunity for us to kind of refresh back now what is Ohm's law. Uh, because it is one of the questions that I think will come out for your paper three. Okay, which we will probably test uh you know in the coming uh, the next few weeks lah, when we open school okay so remember this so when we replace it with a carbon resistor the graph will become directly proportional it become just one straight line like that it won't be a curve and then a straight line okay so this is a diode graph lah, okay which is pretty interesting it's very rare lah. jaram kita jumpa solar ini but i think it's a good opportunity for us to learn this lah. okay that uh when you put a resistor it's just a straight line when you put a diode, okay, it will curve at first and then only it will become a straight line. Okay, the resistance are in that are in that respect. Lah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and also to note uh, this is an interesting what will happen question. Uh. Can just now I said that what will happen question, uh, the answer is always increase, decrease, or unchanged. Okay, but this is slightly different. I cannot say that the graph will increase. <laughs> It doesn't make sense. The graph will remain unchanged. Made possible, huh? it's possible that the graph will remain unchanged, but actually it does change. There's no longer the curve there. It, instead, everything becomes a directly proportional graph. So this is one of those instances, okay, where the what will happen question is, the answer is slightly different. Very rare, okay. Jarang kita jumpa soalan begini, yang what will happen, dia punya jawapan bukan increase, decrease, or unchanged. But it happens. Okay, we cannot be always, oh, what will happen? Okay, let up jala jawapan ni. Okay, it's just for if you don't know, then you put that jawapan lah. But if you know, okay, like in this case, if you know, let's put it in. Uh, okay, so 6.1, 6.2, show two identical loudspeakers. Okay, so this is um when you see a loudspeaker question, okay, this is only one there's only one situation which is talking about this lah, okay, which is the interference one. Okay, interference. Okay, so when we talk about the interference of waves, okay, we need to think about uh, this formula. And I'm going to write this down because there's no way I can do this without writing this down. Okay, so the formula is lambda, <laughs> sorry, equals to A X over D. Okay, the wavelength equals to A X over D. And every one of these, is somehow connected okay so the lambda okay is directly proportional to x okay the a is inversely proportional to x okay and the d <laughs> sorry is directly proportional to x okay just to remind ourselves what is the a what is the d and what is the lambda Okay, so in a situation like this, uh, the A is given over here. Lah. Okay, as you can see, the A is given over here. But, uh, sorry. Okay, the D, uh, the D is from the speaker all the way to wherever the listener is. Lah. Okay, this is the D. Okay, and then the X, uh, the X is the distance between one loud and another loud. Okay, or one soft and another soft. Okay, now whenever I teach interference, I always tell my students, uh, don't remember what the lambda means, what the A means, what the X means, what the D means. Okay, visualize it. Uh, look at the situation and say, oh, okay, this is A, this is X, this is D, like that. Okay, don't like, oh, A, D is the distance between... Yeah, it's good to remember, but it's better to visualize it. Okay, so that you know how each one affects the other. Okay, so A is the distance between the two sources, whether it is two light sources, whether it is two sound sources, okay, or whether it's two water wave sources, A is this distance. Okay, because different waves now uh, will have different definitions. Light, okay, A, uh, if, it, if it is a light experiment, A is the distance between the two slits. But if it is a sound experiment, it is the distance between the two speakers. So it's very difficult to remember so many things, you know. So visualize it. Okay, A is the source. D is the distance from the source to the, the you know, where the screen is. 
x is the distance between one loud to another loud atau one bright to another bright okay so please remember that all right so we notice that in this situation a is like this and the second a is like this look at the x huh? okay look at the x look at the x all right so what is meant by coherent sources okay coherent sources huh? usually there are many things now huh? same this same that same this same that okay but the most important thing is okay waves with uh, same frequency and phase okay just these two will do Usually, same frequency, same phase, same wavelength, same speed, same semua lah. Okay, tapi asalkan saya nampak frequency and phase, I think it's good enough. Okay, actually it's not phase lah, it's phase difference. Oh, here's another person. Alan LC. Is this Eliska? Alan LC. So, they are the LL in it. Oh, but Eliska is still here. Oh, okay. Who is this Alan LC? Oh, no. You know why? Because I'm very afraid uh, that suddenly Sakana spam. Can you know that there's all this like, nonsense spammers? Okay, there's an LC coming in. Okay, who is? Okay, never mind lah. I'm sure these are friends of friends of friends. Kita pandang positif saja. Okay. Tapi kita ada L, kita ada L and LC, and kita ada Elden. So three L's over here. Hi L's. Okay. Compare the distance between the two loudspeakers. This is very easy. Okay. Everybody should be able to do the comparing question. Okay, yang saya, yang saya tidak boleh kompromi, ya. okay, is the comparing question. Everybody must be able to do this. Okay, but uh, if you are my student, I will always say that whenever you compare, write the whole thing in full sentence. Okay, I know that it, I'm very fussy about this. Okay, but I don't, I don't want you to take the risk. Lah. Okay, so the distance between the two loudspeakers, obviously 6.2 is smaller than 6.1. Okay, I'm going to just do this. Uh, in short form, but uh, if you are my student, please remember this. Lah. Okay, put this in full sentence. Compare the distance between two consecutive loud sounds. Okay, so this is one loud sound, this is another loud sound, and this is one loud sound, this is another loud sound. Obviously, kalau kita lihat jarak di antara murid-murid ini, okay, 6.1 and 6.2, which one is bigger, obviously is 6.2. Okay, so you'll be... 6.2 is bigger than 6.1. Okay, the distance between the two consecutive loud sounds. Compare the wavelength of the sound wave. Okay, the wavelength of the sound wave should be the same wavelength lah, because it is the same sound. Let me just double check. Huh? The, the loudspeakers used in each diagram are coherent sources. Two identical loudspeakers. Okay, so this tells us that the wavelength is the same. Okay, the wavelength is the same. So based on the answers in 6b, state the relationship between the distance between the two loudspeakers and the distance between two consecutive loud sounds. Okay, notice that in question one, loudspeaker 6.2 is smaller than 6.1, the distance. Okay, but in question two, the consecutive loud sounds 6.2 is bigger than 6.1. So then you know, the relationship will be one is bigger, one is smaller. One is smaller, one is bigger. Okay, so there are the uh, inversely proportional punya relationship. Lah. Okay, so it will be, uh, we know that one is bigger, one is smaller, right? So the question now is, which one comes first? Does the distance between the two loudspeakers come first or the distance between the two consecutive loud sounds? So this one is where we need to stop and pay attention. Mana yang mempengaruhi mana. You cannot write it the other way around. Okay, be very careful. Huh? The bigger the distance between the two loudspeakers, the smaller the distance between two consecutive loud sounds. Okay, so this is how it will be. The bigger the distance between the two loudspeakers, the smaller the distance between two consecutive loud sounds. It cannot be the other way around. Okay, you cannot say the smaller the distance between two consecutive loud sounds, the bigger the distance between two loudspeakers. Cannot. Because we change the loudspeaker position. 
and then the sound is the one that you know gets affected okay so please remind yourself for this lah okay i'm going to change this to red color so that you don't remember uh, so that you remember sorry okay bila kamu tulis relationship okay the order is very important okay tulis menulis relationship kan macam menulis hypothesis untuk subjek uh, untuk amali fizik okay the bigger the the bigger the tapi manipulated variable mesti datang dulu the first one must be manipulated then only it is uh, the responding variable okay so you cannot mix it up lah <coughs> alright okay name the wave phenomenon i think i've mentioned this already this is interference lah. so i'm just going to leave it as it is okay explain how the loud sounds and the soft sounds are formed by two loud speakers okay so we need to pay attention that they are asking us to explain two things how does the loud sound come about and how does the soft sound come about okay so we need to talk about in terms of interference lah. okay so uh, I'm going to write ooh, the first one. Uh. We're going to talk about the loud sounds. Okay, the loud sound okay, are produced by constructive constructive interference okay, of the two sound waves. Okay, so that's one mark. And then the other mark would be how do you produce the soft sound? Okay, so just just the balik lah. The opposite of the opposite of loud is soft. Soft sounds are produced by opposite of constructive is destructive. Okay, interference of the two sound waves. Okay, one is constructive, one is destructive. Done. You can also say if you want, you want to talk about the. Uh, you want to go into detail about the constructive interference and they say, okay, crest of one wave meets with a crest of another wave. Also can lah. Okay, you can also talk about that. You can talk about the crest meets with the trough okay, of another wave. Also can. Okay, I'm just giving you a sample answer. I'm not saying that if you have another answer, it's wrong. Okay, but I think that, you know, at this point, if you know how to write an alternative answer and you know that the alternative answer is in line with this answer, go ahead with the answer. Okay, it's totally fine. Uh, not a problem at all. <clears throat> what will happen? <laughs> I can't do this question again. What will happen to the distance between the two consecutive loud sounds if the frequency of the sound waves increase? Okay, we saw from the formula just now, which I have already wrapped off. <laughs> okay, we saw that there are three things that affect the, the, the distance between the two consecutive loud sounds, which is X. Okay, so this is X. What happens to X if the frequency increase? But actually, according to the formula, it's lambda equals to AX over D. Okay. We see that there are three things that affect the X, the lambda, the A, and the D. But this question is asking frequency. Okay, so what is the relationship between the frequency? Okay, so frequency and wavelength are related by the wave equation. And if you remember quantum physics, we've already said this so many times that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional to one another. So when the frequency increases, Okay, when the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. Okay, quantum physics, we've learned this. This also we've learned. So if the wavelength decrease, this x is going to decrease. Okay, so that's the answer for this. Lah. Oh, sorry, turn off the allocation. Okay, so the distance between the two consecutive loud sounds, yada yada, will decrease. Okay, and we, we know that by this particular relationship. Okay, so there's only one in, in interference, lah, there's only one inversely proportional relationship, which is the distance between the two speakers. It is inversely proportional. The wavelength, uh, the, the distance between the speaker and the 
people hearing, okay, that is directly proportional. The further you put away, the further the X will be. Okay, so that is an important thing to remember lah, okay, from all this. All right, let's move on to question seven. Uh, okay, if you look at this, uh, so after a while, you will notice uh, that there are the two benda -benda macam ni, uh, construct item number lima. Okay, so although the question is number six, uh, when we talk about construct item, this is a teacher speak. Uh, okay, for us, we understand this. Okay, this question is uh, similar to number five question in the paper two question. That's why I said that this is not a trial paper. This is a module. Okay, untuk kamu membiasakan diri dengan soalan-soalan uh, you know, yang berbentuk SPM. So this number seven question is similar to a number five question, which as you saw just now, it is a comparing question. Okay, so be aware of this. Okay, number five question is probably going to be a compare question. Okay, this is the first year that you're sitting for the new format. And you know, we're making all this uh, jangkaan lah. Okay, which we don't know whether it's going to be true or not, but we can try. Okay, diagram 7.1, 7.2 show ray diagrams for two identical objects through convex lens in a magnifying glass of different thickness. Both lenses produce virtual image. F is the focal point of each lens. Okay, so this is a thin lens and this is a thick lens. Okay, look at the object. Look at the image. Magnifying glass, huh, guys. This is magnifying glass. Okay. Now, what is meant by the virtual image? Okay, this is a important uh this one to remember. Okay, sorry, once again, my internet connection is unstable. So if there is something wrong with my line, please forgive me. Virtual image is image that cannot be captured on a screen. Okay, this is a very specific definition. When I say capture an image on the screen, uh, okay, this is much easier if you have uh if you have spectacles. Okay, if you want to remember how to know whether it can be captured on the screen or not, okay, what you can do is you can take a far away object and then take your specs, right? Okay, then the pass it to you put a you put like a screen lah. <laughs> okay, you put a screen uh, near to the spec. If the picture appears on the screen, that is a real image. If you cannot see the picture on the screen, okay, that means you know the image is somewhere but you can't see it. It is a virtual image. It is an image that cannot be captured on the screen. Okay, I think uh, when we go back to school, I will probably show you this now. Okay, the difference between a uh, virtual image and what is a real image because when we always tend to get confused by this word image that cannot be captured on the screen. Not all images can be captured on the screen, interestingly enough. Okay, so uh, yeah, remind me to show you this when we go back to school. Huh? Okay, so just to uh, just to also say a uh, real image, the definition for real image is image that can be <laughs> captured on a screen. Okay, most of the time people will ask virtual image. Lah. Okay, most of the time SPM, uh, they will usually ask virtual image because it's like a more like, huh, what is a virtual image? Okay, image that cannot be captured on screen. Okay, a real image is image that cannot be that can be captured on the screen, not to be confused. Okay, is not to be confused by uh, you know, like like virtual reality. Uh, okay, that is a different kind of virtual. Lah. Okay, when we talk about images, we talk about virtual image and real image. Can be captured on the screen, cannot be captured on the screen. That's it. Okay, it's a very, very uh, easy definition. Okay, based on diagram 7.1, 7.2, compare the focal length, compare the size, compare the thickness, and compare the position. Wow, so many things to compare. Okay, let's compare the focal length first. Huh? The focal length is different. Okay, look at the focal length here. The focal length is from the lens to the f, 7.1. The focal length is this one. Obviously, 7.2 is smaller than 7.1. Okay, 7.2 is smaller than 7.1. Again, don't forget to put your answers in full. Compare the size of the image. Look at this size of 7.2 and look at this size of 7.1. Obviously, 7.2 is bigger than 7.1. Okay. Again, these are my answers. Okay, 
uh, you can always put it the balik if you want lah. Okay, you will find uh, that generally I like to answer it this way lah. Saya akan pilih satu dan semua saya akan letak di bahagian permulaan. 7.2, 7.2, 7.2, 7.2. Saya akan cakap begitulah. I will usually do that. But I know there are some of you, you always you always want the bigger. 7.1 is bigger than 7.2. 7.2 is bigger than 7.1. You want the word bigger. Okay, so, you know, lain orang, lain ragam, asalkan the comparison is correct. Okay, compare the thickness of the lens. This one, one eye look also, you can see already the difference of the lens. <laughs> okay, you cannot tell me that, oh, I can't see the difference between the thickness. Okay, obviously, 7.2 is bigger than 7.1. Okay, for the thickness of the lens. All right, compare the position of the object from the lens. Okay, look at the position of the object. Okay, 7.1, this is 7.2. Obviously, the 7.2 is bigger than 7.1. Eh, smaller, smaller. 7.2 is smaller than 7.1. Hold on, uh, let me just double check something. Uh. Okay, 7.2 is smaller than 7.1. I was thinking of something else, but okay. Smaller than 7.1. It's nearer to the lens. Lah. Okay, so state the relationship between the thickness of the lens and the focal length of the lens, the F. Okay, look at this. Small thickness, the F is here. Big thickness, the F is here. So what is the relationship? Okay, the bigger the thickness, the smaller the focal length. Okay, that will be what it will be. Lah. The bigger the thickness, the smaller the focal length of lens. Okay, how about the size of the image? Look at the size of the image. Thin lens like this, thick lens like this. Okay, so obviously it will be the bigger the thickness. And I'm in, and if you can see, I'm still maintaining that, you know, the thickness bigger first. Lah. Okay, the bigger the thickness, the bigger the size of the image. Okay, and if you think about it, okay, this is a magnifying glass situation. Okay, magnifying glass. Magnifying glasses are usually... You know the yeah la, the one like you know detective detective guna itu bahkan so magnifying glasses usually are very thick lenses because we want to magnify the image okay we want to magnify the image but it only works if you put it very near to the object like if you put it very far like if you put it over here and the combo thing open it and sana kan it's not gonna work lah okay so you want to have you know small thickness wow there's a person called Andrea. Who is Andrea? Gosh. Okay, we get all kinds of people are coming in at very strange times. But anyway, welcome. Okay. Now, a piece of colored paper cover the upper portion of the convex lens. Means uh, what, you, <laughs> what you do is you cover this one. Lah. Okay, you cover the you cover this upper portion over here. Okay, saya tutup dengan menggunakan kertas. Okay, this is a very interesting question. When I saw this question, I was like, oh, okay, I think it's a trick question. What happens to the size and the brightness of the image produced? What do you think? If you cover the lens, okay, if you cover this lens halfway, what happens to the size and the brightness? Okay, obviously, the size will, what do you think? Bigger, smaller, unchanged? remain unchanged. The size doesn't change. Okay, the size of the image uh, depends on how far or how near you put the, the lens to the object. Okay, so even by covering half the paper, it won't change the size of the image. Okay, but obviously the brightness will be decreased. Okay, brightness will be decreased. Why? Because when you cover the lens, there is less light coming in. Okay, some of you cover not by white paper, no, you cover by color paper, some Lagi lah kurang cahaya akan masuk. So when there is less light coming into the lens, the image you will still see, but it will be less bright. Okay, 
It's a very good question. This is a very good, interesting question. Lah. I was like, oh, okay. Because most people will say, oh, kalau kau tutup bahkan, the image pun akan menjadi lebih kecil. Which doesn't make sense at all if you think about it. Kan? But naturally, yeah, somehow, lah, somehow naturally, you think that, oh, okay, if you cover half, kan, then the image becomes smaller because there's less space in the lens. No, ah. Okay, the size of the image depends on how far or how near. But the brightness depends on how much lens is, you know, how much light is going through the lens. As a magnifying glass, ah, with <laughs> people who have magnifying glass, kan, dia punya magnifying glass yang kecil ini kan tiada guna itu. You must have a big magnifying glass, you know, a big size magnifying glass so that you can let more light enter. More light means more bright. And more bright means more clear. Okay, so it's a very important thing for us to remember. Lah, okay, about this. <clears throat> okay, sorry, hold on. Ah. Okay, 8.1, 8.2. Show two identical containers filled with water at different depth. When the tap is open, the water spurts out at different horizontal distances. Okay, due to the water pressure. Again, this is construct item number six. So just now we saw construct item number five, which is a soalan bandingkan. If you look at the number six question, it is also a bandingkan question. Okay, so we are assuming uh, that question five and question six, okay, are assuming, sorry, are comparing questions. Okay, soalan lima dan soalan enam adalah soalan bandingkan dan lepas itu buat hubungan. And usually there is a what will happen question after that lah. Okay, so you want to have this in mind so that you are mentally prepared. Okay, soalan nombor lima, soalan nombor enam, besar mungkin. Okay, I'm not saying that it is 100% certainty because the format may have changed, but definitely there's going to be two comparing questions. Okay, that much I can say. Okay, what is the meaning of pressure? This is a very uncommon, uh, this one. It's a force per unit area. Okay, so the problem with definition questions sometimes is either kamu tahu atau kamu tidak tahu lah. Not, not every definition is that easy to remember. Some is easy. Rate of change. Okay, macam velocity acceleration. Itu semua rate of change. Impulsive force is also rate of change. Okay, uh, virtual image is a very interesting definition. Okay, so it's easy to remember. But pressure is a little bit hard. Momentum is also easy because it's formula, mass times velocity. is the only definition that uses formula. Oh, uh, well. <coughs> yeah, kind of momentum. Okay. All right. Compare the depth of the tap from the surface of the water. Look at the depth of the tap from the surface of the water. <laughs> okay. This is the depth, huh, guys. Uh, yeah. So this is something also that always people, this one, huh? When we talk about the depth, okay, bila kita bercakap pasal kedalaman, kedalaman diukur dari pada permukaan air, bukan dari pada dasar. This is also a very important thing. So if you take a look at the depth, obviously you will see that 8.1 is smaller than 8.2. Okay, I'm going to start with 8.1 lah. Okay, so. <sighs> 8.1 is smaller than 8.2. Okay, the water pressure at the tap. The water pressure at the tap. Okay, obviously, if you would know this, the bigger the depth, the bigger the water pressure. So 8.1 will also be less than 8.2. Okay, which will be this answer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the horizontal distance, if you look at it, 8.1 is also less than 8.2. So this is uh, like, wow, okay. Senang pula ni soalan kan? So kau tengok dan membandingkan saja. Compare, sorry, state the relationship between the water pressure and the horizontal distance. So water pressure, horizontal distance, smaller pressure, smaller distance. Bigger pressure, bigger distance. Okay, so you can write it in the same format lah. Okay, the bigger the pre the water pressure. Okay, the bigger the horizontal distance of the water spurts out. Gosh. Okay. Now again, uh, guys, can you tebalikan this thing? No, you cannot because the water pressure affects the horizontal distance. 
not the horizontal distance affects the water pressure. So be very careful when you write a relationship. Okay, the depth of the water, water pressure with the depth of the water. Okay, so this is where you will find that. Oh, okay, the tabaric pula. The bigger the depth of the water, the bigger the water pressure. Okay, the bigger the depth of the water, the bigger the water pressure. Notice that in this relationship, the water pressure is the one that is the responding variable because it is the depth that affects the water pressure. Okay, so jangan, don't go into fully automatic mode. Oh, okay, water pressure. Jadi saya tulis dulu lah water pressure, baru saya fikir yang lain. Cannot lah. Okay, even dalam menjawab, ma, we cannot go fully automatic. Okay, pasangkan otak. Boleh itu, can one. Okay, what happens? Always the same question again. What happens to the horizontal distance of the water spurts out in 8.2 if the lid of the container is open? If we open the water container, push, push, sorry, okay, what will happen? What will happen to the horizontal distance? Will it increase? Will it decrease? Will it, uh, you know, will it be sun? Obviously, it will increase. Lah. Why? Why will it increase? Okay, because, and this is a two marks question. Okay, because the, uh, because when you open the, this one, okay, right now, okay, sorry, originally uh, it's closed. Okay, originally it's closed. So that means that uh, the water is being pushed out only by the depth of the design. But when you open the lid, okay, you not only have the water pressure, you also have the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so you so atmospheric pressure enters the bottle. Is it a bottle? Oh, container. Sorry, the atmospheric pressure enters the container. Okay, one mark. The second mark will be. Total pressure uh, increases. Okay, keep it short and simple. Two marks. Atmospheric pressure enters the water. Uh, the total uh, pressure or the total water pressure. Okay, also you can say that. Sorry, actually not total water pressure. Total pressure. Lah. Okay, total pressure in the water increases. Because now it's not just the depth, it's also the atmospheric pressure that is pressing on it. Okay, number nine. Wow, I think we can finish 10 questions today. Should I finish? Oh, this is number seven. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I think we can do that. Okay, number nine. This is a construct for number six again. Okay, so this is a comparing question. Lah. Diagram 9.1, 9.2 show two electrical circuits. The emitter, voltmeter, and the dry cells are identical in both diagrams. Okay, emitter, voltmeter, and dry cells are all identical. The only difference is this. Okay, now this is very familiar uh, for those of you in SA and ST because we did this experiment, right? Remember, one thin wire, one thick wire, tapi sebenarnya bila kita sentuh macam tidak beza bahkan. <laughs> okay, but Look at the situation. Huh? Okay. Name the physical quantity measured by the voltmeter. The voltmeter measures potential difference. Okay. Or voltage. You can also answer either one of it. The one thing that you don't want to answer is volt. Okay. I always see this one. State the physical quantity measured by the voltmeter. Volt. Why is the answer volt wrong? Because volt is a unit. Okay, I also see this now uh, with the current. Instead of answering current, gun, people always answer ampere. Ampere is a unit. It's not a physical quantity. Okay, just like uh, you know, money and RM. Money is a physical. Is a quantity. RM is the unit. Okay, so basically, antara unit than quantity. Okay, voltage or potential difference. Okay, measured by the voltmeter. All right, compare the reading of the emitter, reading of the voltmeter, the length of the conductor, and the thickness of the conductor. Okay, 
let's compare the emitter first. We find the emitter 9.1 is smaller than 9.2. Okay, we can see this by zooming it in. Lah. Well, <laughs> I guess if you look at the pesongan pun kamu tahu sudah lah kan. Okay, so 9.1 is smaller than 9.2. Okay, in terms of the reading of the voltmeter, look at the voltmeter here and the voltmeter here. Interestingly, the voltmeter reading is the same. Okay, the voltmeter reading is the same. In your experiment, I think it is the emitter reading that is the same, right? Then you read the voltmeter. Uh, yeah, but in this case, they are making the voltmeter the same. And then you make the emitter reading, uh, you read the emitter reading. Okay, the length of the conductor. Okay, take a look at this. Huh? The conductors are from identical material but different thickness. And actually, the length is also the same. Okay, so I'm just going to use this answer. The length of the conductor is the same. The thickness of the conductor. This one, obviously, 9.1 is smaller than 9.2. Okay, 9.1 is smaller than 9.2. Now, I just want to mention this in passing. Uh, okay, I would prefer when you write this answer, because uh, always people will say thicker or thinner, right? Okay, the thickness of the conductor in 9.1 is smaller than the thickness of the conductor in 9.2. I would prefer you answer this way. Use the words bigger, smaller, higher, lower, greater. Okay, bigger, smaller, higher, lower, greater. That's it. Don't avoid. Lah. Okay, avoid. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I would rather you avoid things like uh, 9.1 is thicker. Sorry, it's thinner than 9.2. Or 9.2 is thicker than 9.1. I don't like this answer. Lah. Okay. Uh, honestly, yeah. I don't like this answer. I think it's a very sloppy answer. Okay. Please answer in full. Use the words. Safe words. Bigger, smaller, higher, lower, greater. Okay. These are all good words to use because we're measuring physical quantities. Okay. It's not English class. Huh? Thinner, thicker, fatter, smaller. Or you know. Okay. State the relationship between the thickness of the conductor with the current that flows in the circuit. Sorry, hold on. Huh? Oh, okay. Thickness and current flow. Okay, we find that the thicker one has a bigger current flow. Smaller, the not so thick one has a smaller current flow. So, the relationship would be <clears throat> the bigger the thickness, the smaller the current flow. Okay, and once again, everybody, when you write the relationship, be aware which one comes first. Does the thickness affect the current or does the current affect the thickness? It will be quite interesting if the current affects the thickness. Lah, right? Kamu mengalirkan arus terus dia menjadi tebal. Hmm, okay, lain. Okay, so this order is very important. Okay, don't mess it up. The resistance of the conductor. The thickness and the resistance. This one is, uh, you need to know this. Lah. Okay, but it's actually the bigger the thickness did i write the bigger the thickness yeah okay the smaller the resistance okay it's a very standard answer lah. bigger thickness smaller resistance that's why there is a uh sorry did i get this wrong bigger bigger current flow sorry 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 <coughs> the bigger the thickness the bigger the current flow okay yeah sorry sorry my bad Okay, so the bigger the thickness, the smaller the resistance. That's why there is a bigger current flow. Okay, because the thickness is, the, sorry, the current, sorry, the resistance is less already. All right, another identical conductor is connected in parallel in the circuit in 9.1. So we're looking at the, the thin circuit now. Okay, this one. When you connect another conductor, what will happen to the reading of the emitter? The reading of the emitter will be increased. Lah. Okay, why would the reading of the emitter increase? Okay, the reading of the emitter will increase because when you add another conductor in parallel, okay, the more parallel you put, the resistance decreases. 
Okay, when you add things in parallel, when you add another mentor in parallel, you know, or yeah. Okay, and in a way, uh, if you think about it, okay, when you add another, you know, when you add another wire at the bottom, uh, you are sort of increasing its thickness. Kan makin banyak wire kau letak, kan? In parallel, uh, not in series. Okay, you are increasing the thickness of the wire. Okay, in a way, uh, you can look at it that way. Okay, because you are giving the current more space to flow. So more space to flow, when it comes back together, the current flow will increase. Okay, what will happen to this reading? All right, let me see. Hold on now, how many is number seven constructs? Are there two, three. Whoa, there are a lot of seven constructs. Three questions for seven. One, two, three questions for eight. Okay. You know what? I think I will end this here today. Okay. In our next class, which I don't know when it will be. Um, I hope that we can finish this whole thing before the holidays are over. But yeah, in our next class, we'll go with the construct number seven. Okay. Which is question number 10 onwards. Because right now we are at construct number six, which is the comparing questions. One, two, three, four five and six. So we have covered questions that are from number one until number six in paper two. In our next lesson, let's try and see if we can do the construct number seven all the way to number 10.